that's the last one you guys been in a while, so we really appreciate that. Um, last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce the Strong Van Senior Design Project. Uh, my name is Eric Schluter, um, and this is... Tim O'Hara. Claudio Calistri. Elias Simon. Chris Kimps. Shelby Hopkins. Now, to get you guys a little bit more familiar with the project, we thought we'd start off with a problem statement. Um, so we, the Strong Band uh, team has designed and implemented a life safety device that can be used uh, and worn as a bracelet. Uh, it is mainly intended for the elderly uh, and, to, and can um, notify individuals of um, you know, their choosing, the user's choosing, in case of an emergency. Now the Strong Band, once activated, uh, either through the button push or through the user falling, um, will then send a signal to the phone uh, or the user's smartphone. And on the user smartphone, uh, it will use an app developed by us uh, to send a text message with crucial information uh, to the predetermined uh, individuals that the user chooses. Um, so now to kind of give you guys an idea or visualization of what I was talking about, here you'll see the band. Uh, so once activated, it will send a signal uh, to the smartphone. Um, once after about five seconds or so, we'll then send a text message to the predetermined individuals uh, seen by the three phones over here, unless it receives a cancellation signal in case of false alarms. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to talk about the constraints of the project. Uh, our group began uh, last semester with numerous constraints which we prioritized. First and foremost goal was to have a functional prototype by the end of the project at the bare minimum. And uh, next, depending on how difficult it would be to manufacture the van, we could use uh, pre-existing uh, circuitry and components if necessary. We had a budget of $1,200 to complete this project. We wanted to make the bracelet as small as possible so the user would uh, not really notice it and be less inclined to take it off throughout the course of the day. And uh, we uh, wanted to use uh, readily available materials and components to reduce the cost of the project. And finally, we wanted the, the project to be fashionable rather than seen as a medical device. And uh, we chose to use the 3D printers available on campus to uh, fabricate the device, which uh, Claudio can talk more about. So we use Creo 2.0 um, to create a model that would serve as a skeleton and provide structural support for our components. As you can see, we needed a large flat surface area on the top to hold our largest component, which is a dev kit. Uh, at the bottom, we needed a similar surface um, to hold the accelerometer and the motor. Um, after that, we just went ahead and measure our wrist to get the dimensions of the inner loop and the gap to fit our wrist into. Um, finally, uh, with, the help of doc, with the help of Dr. Leifert, uh, we thought that a thickness of a quarter of an inch would be um, appropriate for our design because it makes our band strong enough, but at the same time, it allows us to uh, feel the vibration feedback from the motor. Now I'm going to hand it off to um, Eric to talk about the components. So let's actually kind of dissect the band a little bit. So key fob, which we'll see up here in the top picture, um, is what we call a key fob, or I like to call the evaluation board. Uh, now this holds both, or excuse me, the following, the Bluetooth energy chip, the button, as well as the battery. Now the Bluetooth energy chip allows the communication between the band and the uh, smartphone, and specifically the application on the smartphone. Uh, the button is one way that the user can activate the band to then send a signal to uh, the smartphone application. Uh, and finally, the battery uh, powers the Bluetooth low, Bluetooth low energy chip, as well as the accelerometer and the motor. So now let's talk about the accelerometer, which you see down here in the lower picture. Uh, now this uh, picture features the accelerometer, as well as the feedback motor, as well as the uh, feedback motor driver circuit. Uh, the accelerometer is, uh, uh, is capable of um, determining when the user falls. Uh, then. Uh, we use the feedback motor to, uh, excuse me, we then use the feedback driver circuit um, to use the feedback motor to let the user know um, when the device is activated and will send uh, a signal if it does not receive a cancellation signal. Um, now, let's talk about the actual app design. So, with the help of our consultant, we uh, developed a very basic app, uh, which is perfect for this project, that will be able to send a text message that consists of the user's name as well as the user's GPS coordinates um, once activated. Uh, here we have a short video for you that will demonstrate the, uh, or I guess give you uh, reference to what the app looks like, as well as the basic functions of connecting to the band and inputting emergency contact information. When you first open the app, this is what you will see. Uh, in order to connect to the band, uh, you first press connect, then you go to the band itself and start advertising as seen by the flashing light. Next, you start the scan. Uh, which will then uh, discover the band, then you stop scanning, 
and then you now connect to the band by pressing uh, the device. Now, for the, this demonstration purposes, we did not disable the debugging, but this can easily be removed for the final design. Next, if we want to add contacts, we first then uh, exit out of the connect and go back to the contacts and press add contact. Here, you insert the name as well as a phone number and uh, any predetermined individual that you would like to be contacted uh, when the device is uh, activated. Now, if you guys excuse my little uh, sausage fingers, um, I was going to do stuff not sure about that one, I saw that later. Uh, but next, I'm going to hand it off to Elias to talk about the embedded systems for our system. Uh, because the Bluetooth standard is hundreds of pages long, uh, Texas Instruments gives you a Bluetooth stack and an operating system abstraction layer that you write your code on top of uh, when you use one of the Bluetooth chips. Uh, basically, what's unique about Bluetooth low energy scheme by which two devices decide how they're going to talk to each other and then uh, in sync they go to sleep and wake back up and communicate again. Um, this saves a lot of power um, and some low energy. Um, the parameters that we decided on for our devices is that the phone would listen for a message from the band every 31.25 milliseconds. Uh, the band only wakes up uh, every 4.9 seconds if uh, the user doesn't send a message. Uh, this saves a lot of power on the strong band. Uh, but ensures a very quick response time when uh, a user actually has, needs to send an alert. Uh, this is the uh, this is the logic behind in our interpretation of the user input. Uh, basically, the microcontroller is just going to wait for input most of the time. If the user presses a button, it starts vibrating, saying, "Hey, the button got pushed somehow." Um, this gives the user a chance to cancel. Uh, cancel the message sending if, uh, if the button accidentally got bumped or something. Um, if uh, the user presses the button again and cancels it, it just goes back to wait for user input. Uh, if, the, if the strong band detects free fall, it starts waiting for impact. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it starts listening for impact. If there's no impact, uh, after a half a second, it just goes back to waiting for user input. If it does detect impact, uh, within a half second, uh, it starts vibrating, saying, hey, I'm about to send a message. Um, if, and the, if the user doesn't cancel it, it uh, after five seconds, it sends a message and then goes back to the user input. And uh, now we have a video demonstrating the whole system.
We, um, these falls became our main focus because of the likelihood of the user being unconscious during the fall or being rendered unconscious after the fall, and they would not be able to activate the band themselves. And so it was imperative that the band activated itself. So you can see that it was also very accessible, or very successful because uh, the band activated the vast majority of the time. And because we were so excited about these results for our intended design, we decided to push it a little bit further to see what other movements or falls the, the band would respond to. So we went ahead and did some further testing. So we came up with some uncommon movements for the elderly, which we decided were a little more active than just walking or reaching for items. And for these, um, it'd be undesired if the band activated. And then we also came up with some bonus out of scope falls, just to see what the band would respond to and how it performed in these kind of gray area situations. And so now Chris will tell you about the results. So our results for these types of movements uh, were better than we expected, actually. And uh, for example, some of the movements we did were jogging, golfing, and jumping, which you might think a lot of elderly people might not be doing those usually, but um, I actually know a lot of elderly people that could benefit from this device, but also like to golf, for example. And um, so anyways, as the previous one, the previous results slide, uh, the X's represent that the band was not triggered and the O's represent that it did. So for example, jogging, um, it only triggered it once. And that was actually Shelby running and she's on the soccer team. So I mean, I don't think an elderly person is going to be running faster than that. But the point is, <laughs> we were very happy with these results. And it showed uh, you know, promise for the future if we wanted to take the band a step further. And um, as far as the falls go, um, these falls were not ones that were as detrimental if they were to occur. For example, falling off of a chair would most likely not knock you unconscious, and same with falling forward onto your knees or wrists. And in those situations, the user would be able to press the button that's on the band if they actually need to help. So next, Tim's going to talk about the evaluation of our results. Or, sorry, constraints. Uh, as we progress through this design process, we realized that uh, we would not be able to develop our own circuit board due to the in unavailability, unavailability sorry, of uh, the right equipment on campus and uh, the lack of funds to uh, send the board off to be manufactured elsewhere. Therefore, we were uh, forced to use pre-existing components uh, to create a successful prototype. And this caused our manufacturing difficulty, material availability, and component availability constraints to be no longer applicable for this project, which is why they have a little NA. And the components that we uh, did use to create the band did cause the band to be pretty large and not uh, very appealing to the eye, so we gave ourselves an X for those constraints. But most importantly, the uh, prototype did function with all uh, basic operations uh, operating properly and we play the project well within our budget. And next I'm gonna have Chris and Shelby talk about the uh, Strong Guys performance. So overall, the Strong Guys performed very well. Every time the band is activated, the Bluetooth successfully sent a signal to the phone app. There was never a time where that failed, the signal failed to send. And same goes with the vibration motor feedback. Every time the band is activated, you could feel the motor vibrating, giving the user feedback that we designed for. And then initially our accelerometer was designed to listen for uh, a fall. And then if it, um, if it detected that fall, then it would activate the band. Um, but with that design, we had a lot of unwanted band activations, like during normal everyday movement. And it was also very inconsistent for the backwards fall, which we thought was the most important um, aspect. And so to tackle this problem, we designed the accelerometer to listen for a sequence of events. And this, sequ this sequence was a fall followed by an impact. And so once it detected this sequence, then it would activate the band. And once we implemented this, the band performed uh, extremely well. So I'll hand it off to Eric to sum up. So I should have said earlier, we did successfully achieve our goal of creating a uh, you know, functional prototype. Uh, but if we were allotted some more time uh, and we wanted to implement some more changes, we would first uh, re uh, refine the um, app so that it was a 
visually more appealing. Uh, we would then also want to add a third event uh, to our fall detection sequence. Um, so this new sequence would first detect free fall, uh, then it would detect impact, and then finally um, detect that there was no activity after uh, the impact fall. So with this new sequence, we would hopefully uh, decrease the amount of uh, false alarms as well as uh, increase the band's uh, performance in the uh, bonus out-of-scope falls. Uh, now I'm going to give it to Claudio so he can talk about um, how we would further change the physical band if we were allowed more time. So <clears throat> after achieving our main goal of having a, work, a worker prototype, uh, we thought that one of the important future goals for our group would be to make our band more, more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, in that modification and design, we would make it, we would make the band much smaller. And the new encasing would be made out of carbon steel spring, which allows for flexibility while still providing structural support for the components. A new addition for our band would be to have an outer encasing to protect all of our circuitry. Uh, for this, we would use TPU which would allow us to not only uh, protect our components from impact, but also it would make it uh, waterproof uh, due to its uh, liquid resistant features. So this all couldn't be done without these fallen people. Mayor on our academic advisor, you know, coming every Monday to travel with us for helping us, uh, you know, steer us in the right direction. Ernest for sitting there and helping us with the soldering. Uh, Oliver Yin, who is our smartphone consultant, and then uh, Jonathan, who's kind of helped us push us in the right direction at the very beginning. And last but not least, Amy, who was there through the entire year. Um, we thank you guys so much, and we couldn't have done without you. So thank you. signal so that it doesn't uh, send those three text messages to people saying, hey, uh, I'm hurt, the action weren't. We did a uh, plan for that. And it is designed to first detect a free fall. Yeah. So if you're, yeah. you, know, you need the seat. Yeah. It's not a free fall, can you still impact it won't go off because it doesn't detect a free fall. Yeah. Well, I think we had one question back here, then here's All right, uh, small ones. Is the battery used to replace the uh, because of the components that we were had to use, uh, we just used a battery that fit this type of cradle. And so as far as, Shelby can touch on more exactly what I, if we were able to use our own components. Yeah, if we had the choice to design our own PCB and use our own battery, we could have chosen a much you know, more efficient battery and it's like sleeker and curved. But because we are constrained to the, the cradle that we have, because um, we weren't able to make our own PCB, uh, we had to use the battery that came with the. Oh, okay, so that'd be kind of closer to lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. So we were restricted to that. And the second question is uh, do you guys do any durability tests that's supposed to be for people falling out of it? Uh, so we, this is the prototype, so we're just doing proofs of concept. Um, Claudio was kind of talking about the outer encasing. Claudio, you want to talk about that? Yeah, durability. Yeah. So uh, basically, what would happen is now that we would have the components, we're 
yeah. should be way smaller. There you can see. It should be way smaller. You would first have the skeleton, which you would, where you would have uh, all the components. Then you would have a coating, and then you would have the outer um, encasing, which would protect all of that and would be would be practically just impossible to destroy. Well, by <laughs> impact, by no point. For normal use. I think there's that question. Yeah. Can you also apply to that person that you fell down and you can't even like put your phone like this in translation? Would you like have to go and like JK all along? I mean, yeah, you, you can just, I mean, just respond to that? Like the individual that you sent to, or who knows? So you can send to the person and then show me your inbox or your sandbox and text messages? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think Sang had one. Yes. So the reason we use, uh, I guess, use the phone is to make it as cheap as possible because there are devices that have a bunch of all of the, you know, kind of cell phone capabilities inside of it. Uh, but that also jacks up the price, and then you have to talk about, okay, what network am I going to use? How am I going to actually send the notification? Um, so then you, you start increasing the price. The idea behind this was to make this device as cheap as possible, um, so it is as widely available to individuals. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Any other questions?